Thanks for joining us today on this edition of Arirang News. Live from Seoul, I'm Lee Jun. Let's get a check of today's headlines. The Islamic State sets a new deadline of Thursday sunset for a hostage prisoner swap. It wants to swap an Iraqi suicide bomber held in Jordan with its Jordanian pilot hostage. Amid all this, the fate of Japanese hostage Kenji Goto is remaining unclear. Senior officials from South Korea and the U.S. agree that their priority is to denuclearize North Korea and to keep on working together to further engage Pyongyang. The U.S. Fed leaves its interest rate alone, saying that it will stay patient and starting to normalize its monetary policy. The Islamic State has set a new deadline for its Jordanian hostage. The group is demanding Jordan to take the convicted Iraqi suicide bomber to the Turkish border by sunset Thursday, or else it'll execute the Jordanian pilot. The fate of the Japanese hostage, however, remains unclear. Our Kim Jion has the latest. Islamic State militants have set a new deadline for swapping Iraqi prisoner Sajida al-Rashawi for a captured Jordanian pilot. A message allegedly from IS says al-Rashawi should be delivered to the Turkish border by sunset on Thursday. It says the Jordanian hostage will be executed immediately if Jordan does not hand her over by the new deadline. Jordanian state TV quoted government spokesman Mohammed al mumani asking Amman is willing to make the exchange. The Jordanian government spokesperson said it is ready to free Sajid al-Rishawi if First Lieutenant al-Kasabi is safely released from IS captivity. Momani said the release of the pilot, who comes from a prominent family in Jordan, is important to the monarchy. But the exchange would go against Amman's policy of not negotiating with extremists and could potentially set a new president. Amid the crossroads, the father of the pilot demanded the government secure his son's swift release. Jordanians should push their government to protect the life of their son or otherwise your king is the one who killed him and his stubbornness. You have to know that my son will not be the last soldier or Jordanian citizen who will be sacrificed. The Jordanian pilot was captured in northern Syria in December when his F-16 fell from the sky. Sajida al-Rashawi has been behind bars for over a decade for attempting a suicide bomb attack in Jordan. There was no mention of the Japanese hostage Kenji Koto in the new offer, also being held by Islamic State. Tokyo says it's working closely with Jordan for Koto's release. Kim Jong, Arirang News. Meanwhile, it's been confirmed that no Koreans were killed in the deadly attack on a luxury hotel in Libya, the attack that left at least 10 dead, including five foreigners. The Korean embassy in Tripoli told Yonam News on Thursday that the five foreign casualties included one U.S. citizen, one French national, and three people from Kyrgyzstan. Militants loyal to the Islamic State have claimed responsibility for the attack, releasing photos of two suicide bombers whom it said carried out the attack. Two gunmen burst into the five-star hotel on Tuesday and set off a car bomb in the parking lot. Now to a development, if it's true, could again stir up tensions on the Korean Peninsula. North Korea appears to be trying to restart its main nuclear bomb fuel reactor after it's been shut down for more than five months. Our Connie Kim reports. After nearly half a year of supposed inactivity, North Korea may have restarted operating its main nuclear reactor. Satellite imagery posted on the 38 North website shows hot water draining from a pipe at the 5 megawatt Yongbyon reactor and snow melting on the roof of the reactor and turbine buildings, possible signals that efforts to restart it are taking place inside. The U.S. Korea Institute at Johns Hopkins University, which runs 38 North, says the developments were observed over a two-week period from December 24th to January 11th. It stresses, however, that it's too early to determine what exactly is happening at the reactor. This latest development comes as the two Koreas have been making overtures toward holding inter-Korean talks. On the other hand, U.S.-North Korea relations are frosty over North Korea's alleged cyber attack on Sony Pictures. 
Experts say that while suspicious, the latest activity at the reactor could be fairly innocuous. It's hard to tell. The activities could be linked to simple maintenance procedures preparing for the summertime. However, if the Yongbyon reactor is being restarted, I think it'd be a means to pressure the U.S. more than South Korea. The Yongbyon nuclear reactor is closely watched as it's where Pyongyang produces its weapons-grade plutonium. Adding to concerns, North Korea is thought to have made progress on its ballistic missile technology. Just recently, in its defense white paper, Seoul said the North had taken big steps toward making nuclear warheads small enough to fit on ballistic missiles. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Staying with North Korea, a visiting U.S. official has reiterated that the United States has the same policy as South Korea when it comes to North Korea. Following talks with South Korea's first vice foreign minister, Cho Tae-yong, on Thursday, U.S. Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Wendy Sherman, said the first shared priority of the two allies is denuclearizing the North. She said all parties of the six-party nuclear talks, aside from North Korea, are working together to see what more they can do to engage Pyongyang. Sherman, however, refused to lay out the specific steps the North must take to show its sincerity for denuclearization. The multilateral dialogue involving the two Koreas, the U.S., China, Japan and Russia, has been stalled for more than six years. South Korean and U.S. defense officials also plan to hold a second round of annual cybersecurity talks in Washington in the coming months. The two allies launched a cyber cooperation working group back in 2013 and held their first meeting in Seoul last February. At the second meeting, the officials are expected to focus on how to better manage cyber attacks originating from North Korea and strengthen information sharing networks. The working group will analyze the weak points of the two countries' capabilities to respond to any forms of cyber attack. The meeting follows Pyongyang's alleged cyber attack on Sony Pictures in November. Turning now to a revelation by former President Lee Myung-bak. The former South Korean president says that while he was in office, North Korea offered to hold an inter-Korean summit and apologize over the deadly torpedo attack on a South Korean warship if the South gave it half a million tons of rice. Here's Hwang Jie with more. Former South Korean President Lee Myung-bak has shed light on previously hidden history between the end of 2009 to early 2011. He says Pyongyang asked for 500,000 tons of rice in July 2010 in return for inter-Korean talks and its apology for the Cheonan warship sinking. This came in an extract reported by Seoul-based Yeonam News Agency on Thursday ahead of the official release of his 800-page memoir on his presidency. The former president said he refused the offer because it would have been under Pyongyang's terms and he was not comfortable with it. He added the North's planned statement on the Cheonan warship sinking would have been a general apology, not an acceptance of its responsibility. He also said he strongly pressured then-Chinese President Hu Jintao during a G20 meeting in June 2010 to enforce international sanctions against Pyongyang after the deadly sinking. On his highly controversial river restoration project, he pointed to other major government projects that faced criticism at the time but were evaluated to be successful by future generations. The Four Rivers Project, a signature project of the former leader, has long been under fire over alleged shady construction deals and the irreversible damage it has done to local ecosystems. His book called President's Time is set to hit shelves next Monday. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Inter-Korean relations might have been sour last year, but trade between the two Koreas flourished last year. Our Shin Zemin has the details. Could this be a bright sign for the two Koreas' future relations? The Korea International Trade Association said on Wednesday, inter-Korean trade volume topped $2.3 billion in 2014, more than double the figure from the year before. The cumulative trade volume over the past 26 years is $22 billion. Inter-Korean trade dropped to an eight-year low in 2013, the year Pyongyang shut down the jointly run Kaesong Industrial Complex, citing heightened tensions on the peninsula. It resumed operations there five months later. The products from the complex account for almost all inter-Korean trade. 
The recent jump in trade volume could get an extra boost from a recently concluded free trade pact between Seoul and Beijing, as the two sides agreed to acknowledge Kaesong products as being South Korean in origin. Manufacturers who invest in the Kaesong complex will gain a competitive edge, as their labor costs will be lower than those in China. But obstacles to the stable growth of inter-Korean trade remain, with bilateral tensions a major concern. North Korea added a new clause in September last year that allows it to detain South Korean businessmen if they do not comply with a contract or fail to make agreed payments. Pyongyang held South Korean businessmen when it shut down the complex in April 2013, saying they had outstanding bills. Another challenge will be expanding the capacity of the factories within the complex. Seoul banned facilities investment in the joint complex after the sinking of Chonan warship in 2010. Shin Arirang News. The U.S. Fed has reiterated that it will remain patient in determining when to raise interest rates, citing the country's unusually low inflation. However, it did say the U.S. economy is expanding at a solid pace. Our community reports. The Federal Reserve signaled its plans to raise its key interest rates sometime later this year. At the end of a two-day policy meeting in Washington on Wednesday, the U.S. Central Bank said it will be patient when determining the appropriate time to boost interest rates. What's worth noting here is the change in wording from when it said it would keep the rate unchanged for a considerable time. The Fed said that the U.S. economy was growing at a solid pace, citing improved labor market conditions with strong job gains and a lower unemployment rate. The central bank also said the declines in energy costs had boosted the purchasing power of households and inflation has declined below the committee's longer-run objective. As for when it would lift the rates from the current zero to quarter percent range, the Fed said that it would take into account a wide range of information, including measures of labor market conditions, inflation expectations, and ratings on financial and international developments. The central the bank has kept interest rates low to stimulate the U.S. economy in the, the wake of the financial crisis. Analysts estimate a rate hike necessary. as early as June. Kim min Arirang News. Back here in Korea, Samsung Electronics managed to recover from its third quarter earnings shock last year thanks to its chip sales, which hit a four-year high last quarter. Our Song Ji-san has the details. It may now be safe to say that Samsung has rebounded from its earnings shock in the third quarter of last year. Samsung Electronics has released the final figures for its fourth quarter earnings, with an operating profit of $4.9 billion of 30 percent from the previous quarter. That's a 36 percent decrease from the same quarter a year earlier, but the fall is smaller than the 49 percent on-year drop in the third quarter as Samsung's chip businesses reported strong sales. Memory chips have become Samsung's biggest profit driver in the third quarter, overtaking handsets, and now account for more than half of the company's profit at $2.5 billion. Profit for the mobile division plummeted to just $1.8 billion from 2013's $5 billion as the competition got fears for the Korean handsome maker in both high- and low-end smartphones. For all of 2014, Samsung logged $190 billion in total sales, down 10 percent from 2013. Samsung's final Q4 figures come just days after its rival Apple announced a record net income of $18 billion from the same period, nearly four times higher than that of Samsung's. Analysts forecast a modest recovery for the company this year on the back of demand for its memory chips and processors from its rival smartphone makers. Samsung also followed other Korean firms in committing to pay higher dividends to its shareholders by raising the amount by nearly 40 percent from a year earlier to $18 per share. Song ji Sun, Arirang News. Well, no signs yet that Korea's unemployment blues are getting any better. In fact, it seems to be getting worse. Figures show the youth unemployment rate in Seoul breached a 10 percent mark for the first time ever last year. 
According to a new report by the Seoul Metropolitan Government, the number of unemployed people between the ages of 15 and 29 stood at 100,000 in 2014, up well over 20 percent from the previous year. Now, that's the highest it has been since the city began collecting related data in the year 2000. The overall number of unemployed in Seoul also spiked 15 percent last year from a year earlier to record high of slightly over 240,000. When investors think of emerging markets worth putting money into, many still think of Brazil, Russia, India, and China, also known as the BRIC group. But some analysts suggest now is the time to look beyond those nations. Our Ajin Ju has more. Apart from the BRIC countries, which do you think is the most promising emerging market this year? The Korea International Trade Association asked some 540 Korean companies this question, and the answer is Vietnam. In fact, most of the countries ranked high on the list were Southeast Asian countries, namely Indonesia, Thailand, and Malaysia. The top 15 nations also include Saudi Arabia, Mexico, and Poland. What's noticeable about these countries is their demographics. The Trade Association says young people between the ages of 15 and 24 make up a big portion of the population of those top 15 countries. This means they have a lot of room to grow as these are the people who will lead future production and consumption. This is perhaps why more than half of the Korean firms surveyed said they are considering making inroads into those markets. As for the top choice Vietnam, its economic growth last year hovered above the global average at 5.6 percent and is forecast to continue that momentum this year. The most volatile variable for Hanoi is crude oil prices. As an oil exporting country, falling crude prices will hurt its GDP, but Vietnamese officials say it will also help bring down the country's high inflation rate. But no matter what the case, experts warn that those wishing to enter these emerging markets, including Vietnam, will have to vigorously monitor the market conditions and utilize free trade agreements, as these countries often come with high risks. Oh Jin Ju, Arirang News. Koreans' love for coffee is showing in the record amount of coffee imports last year. The nation's customs service and the coffee industry said Thursday that nearly 140,000 tons of coffee beans and coffee powder were imported in 2014, the highest amount since 2011. Convert, convert that now into money, and that adds up to some 595 million U.S. dollars worth of coffee, up over 18 percent from the previous year. The jump is attributed to the lower cost of coffee beans from the U.S. after the Korea-U.S. free trade agreement in 2012. The coffee industry says Koreans' growing desire for a cup of coffee following a meal also played a big role. The Barbizon School in France is known for breaking with tradition and trying to portray a more realistic image of our natural surroundings. The school is led by the beloved artist Jean-Francois Millet, and some of his original works are now here in Korea. And we're now joined by our Im Hyun Hee to tell us more. Hello. Hello. So, right, Millet revolutionized art with his work. So he really focused on nature, on the beautiful landscapes, and on people who were previously unseen in art. Now, he went on to influence many future artists, including some who went on to become the most important artists of our time. Take a look at this exhibition. Life in the beautiful countryside. Women doing laundry by the stream, and men harvesting the fields. These are the landscapes of Fontainebleau, the French countryside that inspired many artists from the 19th century. Artists such as the legendary Theodore Rousseau, and of course Claude Monet, they all found inspiration from the rustic countryside. And even Vincent van Gogh found admiration for not just the lands of Fontainebleau, but also the artist who was at the center of it all, Jean-Francois Millet. 
Millet is a French painter from Normandy who lived from 1814 to 1875. He is known for leading the Barbizon School, which was a forefront of the realism art movement at a time when artists began focusing on beautiful landscapes, peasants and farmers, instead of dramatic religious scenes and wealthy people. You could even say he's one of the fathers of the modernism art movement. To celebrate the 200th year of Millet's birth, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston put together an extensive collection of over 60 different original works that tell the story of the Barbizon School and its contributions to the birth of modernism. Included in the exhibition are four of Millet's major paintings. Paintings that not only influenced many future artists, but also played a key role in ushering in different art movements, such as the Harvester's Resting Painting, one of his most famous works that Millet poured his life into completing. Millet considers this his most important painting and practiced on over 50 different drafts before making the final product. He played around with positioning of the figures and calculated everything. The subtitle says Ruth the Boas and it tells the story of this woman named Ruth and a man next to her named Boas. The woman was recently widowed, but she works very hard in the fields with her mother-in-law to keep them alive. Boa sees how hard she's working and falls in love with her, and they end up marrying. Millet retells the biblical story of redemption and hard work through a contemporary scene. There are many places, many people, many faces that contributed to the development of art. But there are a few artists legends in the field who have made their mark and will forever be recognized. Artists such as Jean-Francois Millet. Well, you mentioned in the report that mm -hmm. these works are actually from the Museum of Fine Arts from Boston. Boston, right. Yes. So this museum has very close ties to the artist Millet that date all the way back to 1850s. Um, in fact, they process more Millet works than anywhere else in the world, and they have the largest collection of original works. Now, the exhibition they're currently showing here in Seoul um, has four of their most prized you know, paintings mm -hmm. by Millet, so really something to go check out. Well, I knew Millet was an influential artist. I mean, mm -hmm. we all probably know, but I didn't know that he was such an inspiration to Van Gogh. Right, right. So he really was an inspiration to Van Gogh. In fact, Van Gogh mentions Millet in many of his letters that he wrote to his brother. And you can actually read these letters at the uh, Korean National War Memorial through February. But it wasn't just Van Gogh. Millet influenced many other artists, including the uh, painter Salvador mm -hmm. Dali. Uh, you could see his influence also in, in writers such as a Mark Twain, American author Mark Twain. So really, uh, Millet's decision to focus on these peasants, these farmers, mm -hmm. and the details of their lives really showed through even after he was done painting. All right. Well, when does this run until? This runs for a few more months through okay. May, so you could definitely check it out. Okay, so we have plenty of time to check mm -hmm. that out. Maybe All right. this weekend. Okay, thanks for coming today. You're very welcome. Good afternoon, I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. The temperature yesterday morning was a very chilly, negative 10 degrees, but it's recovered back up to the seasonal average. Currently, Seoul is up above zero degrees, which is expected to be the case all throughout the day. Now, the sky, however, is looking very gray and filled with clouds, and it's currently raining over on Jeju Island and Jeollanamdo province. Now, the precipitation is expected to expand all across the country uh, in the southern regions at first, and by the evening uh, here in the nation, except here in Seoul. Now, there is also a heavy snow advisory in effect in the mountainous regions of Jeju Island. Now, Chungcheongdo province and the rest of the southern regions can expect between 1 to 5 centimeters of snow, while the rest can expect even less. Now, to our readings for today, so will peak up to 3 this afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan will top at 3 and 7 degrees. 
And to other regions such as Jeju Island gets up higher at 8, Tokyo hits down to 3 again, while Mount Kungang drops low to negative 5 degrees. Well, that's all for now. I'm Michelle Park and have a wonderful day. All right, that brings us to the end, but I'll be back with more at 4 p.m. Korea time, so stay tuned. Thanks for watching.